Good evening, everyone. My name is Dean. I'm an alcoholic. I don't have any notes. <laughs> I want to thank Ron for inviting me and for the mission of hospitality that was extended to me since I've been here since uh, 2 o'clock this afternoon. I, um, I just feel like I want to stay, but I'm only going to be staying on until 5 o'clock tomorrow morning, so I hope you're comfortable in those chairs. Because uh, I have a long story. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm really impressed with uh, what is happening here. Until I get to a place, I'm not really sure exactly what I'm supposed to do. Am I supposed to speak at a roundup or at an anniversary or what? And this just feels so right and so wonderful. And I was uh, especially impressed with the staff of the hospital. And when you mentioned, uh, Doug, about the, you know, the way we get as recovering people to touch the larger community, uh, it was so impressive to me. And I believe that that is our life work, and that seems to be fully alive here in the city. And I'm awfully delighted to, to see that. Well, what I wanted to tell you was that if my God were to appear to me at this moment, and I don't know why she doesn't, um, I, uh, I, uh, and she were to say to me, um, is there so any place else you'd like to be rather than here? And I would say, no, thank you. I have to say, I would say, no, thank you, Father. <laughs> but uh, I was sitting beside a priest at, at dinner, and so I had to do that. I just wanted my parents to do that. <laughs> anyway, um, what I wanted also to tell you is that my life was wonderful until I was two. And uh, so that's why I want you to be comfortable in your chairs. And if you need to go out and have a smoke, you can do that because uh, this is a long story. Um, when I was two, what happened for me was my sister was born. And um, for some reason, my parents, being Irish and Catholic, they didn't ask my permission. And uh, I would never understand, I still don't to this day, why I move around this universe called life, you know, and people don't ask my permission for lots of things. Uh, you know, I just wonder why the rest of the world doesn't consistently shape up and behave so that I could fit into it a little bit better. So this has been happening to me since I was two. And this little girl was brought into the family and she didn't have freckles and she didn't have red hair. And it seemed that my uh, parents um, spent a lot of time adoring at her crib. And uh, then my, my parents went on every year having another baby, like they had a boy and then they had a girl and then they had a girl. And it seemed like every time a new child came into the family, I felt like I didn't fit. Now, nobody ever told me that I didn't belong there, and I believe I was well taken care of, but I just didn't feel like I fit it, and I was on the periphery of life right from those early years. And to top all of that off, when I was eight years of age, my father went to work one day, and he never came home. He was, um, he was killed in an accident. A tree fell on top of him and killed him instantly. And uh, I didn't know how to do grief or loss or mourning or all of the things that the opportunities that people get to do today to take care of those feelings. Uh, but what I do remember was that on the day of my father's funeral, my mom said to me, B, I want you to help me to raise these children. And I put away my dolls and my play things and I started about this big event, which has not occurred for me yet, this big event called Growing Up. And um, I remember well exactly, you know, just the feeling of now I was little and I was playing, it seemed like, and then I wasn't. I, I suddenly assumed the responsibility of the, these children and my mom. And my mom, you know, she just taught me everything she knew. She taught me how to clean and cook and babysit. And she was a school teacher. And she taught me how to do all sorts of school teachery kinds of things. In fact, my mom taught me what is referred to in our big book, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous on page 60, where it says, is she not a victim of the delusion that she can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if only she will manage well? And I thought my purpose in life was to learn how to manage well and to become efficient. And so when I got into my teenage years, I did what most people do in those years, I started thinking about what I would want to be doing for the rest of my life. And what I decided to do was to become a saint. 
Now, uh, when I go to AA meetings, they read a piece out of the book there on page, uh, chapter 5, and they say, we are not saints, and my feelings used to get hurt in this week. <laughs> and in trying to become a saint in those years, what I decided to do was to become a Catholic nun. Now, I can tell with an audience as large as you are, that there might be at least one or two people out there who have a resentment against somebody like me. <laughs> I just want to clear the air immediately. And uh, what I need to tell you is that I didn't do it to you, okay? <laughs> Maybe Donna did or somebody else here. I, I didn't do this to you. And um, what I've discovered since I get into alcohol synonymous is that um, my sponsors always tell me not to be saying this in public, but I'm as far away from home, so I'm going to say it here. And what, I, what I discovered was that they're assholes everywhere. <laughs> Some Catholic assholes, some different assholes, some Catholic assholes, and uh, Methodist ones, and uh, one or two Jewish ones I've met. And, uh, and in, in Southern California, where I live, there are one or two in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I am, I have uh, not found any in Al Anon yet. So, uh, but then. Um, what I, I just, you know, when I got into Alcoholics Anonymous, I took the, the weight and the responsibility of the entire Catholic Church on my shoulders, and that's a very heavy load to carry around. But uh, anyway, I started into this um, Catholic nun business, which I'm still doing. In fact, I've been doing it for 41 years, 7 months, and 3 days. And, um, well, you'd be counting it yourself for that long. <laughs> That. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> so I started into this uh, deal um, on the 16th of July, 1950, and uh, before a lot of you were born, and um, and I loved it, and I love it, and I enjoy this lifestyle more than I can tell you. I love my vocation, and I love everything about it. And uh, what happened to me was with my superiors, I was living in Ireland then, as you can tell, I was born and raised in Ireland, and my superiors sent me over to England to finish my education. And I did that rather successfully, and I was uh, assigned to teach in a school in England, and I loved teaching. I loved uh, opening up children's minds and bringing them down the path of learning, and I just thought this was a very exciting thing. When a most unusual event occurred in my head, and I know that you won't know what I'm talking about, but I need to be honest with you, and what happened in my head was that on a regular basis, a voice would go off, and the voice would say, if only they would shift up, I would feel better. And it didn't matter who they were, it could be the people with whom I lived, it could be the parents of the children whom I taught, it could be the government, it could be anybody. And this voice kept going on in my head and I started feeling some of the feelings that I didn't know what they were until um, I got into Alcoholics Anonymous, the grief and the loss and the pain and the loneliness that I'd never done, never taken care of. Some of the causes and conditions, I believe. I know today that alcohol is but a symptom of my disease. And so uh, I finished uh, that and uh, one day I came home from school, I was teaching hard and I was trying to be very successful. And when I came home from school one day, on our bulletin board there was a letter from our major superiors back in Ireland. And the letter said, would any of you like to volunteer to go to Southern California because we're starting a new place there. And of course I knew I belonged in Hollywood, so I signed up and I volunteered and I thought I would go. And so I got picked and uh, when I was leaving, my superior said to me, and sister, we're going to put you in charge. Now, there is nothing that a potential alcoholic likes to hear better than they're going to be put in charge. Now, you may not agree with this, but uh, certainly for this alcoholic, I love to be in charge. It's one of the things I do the best and the, and the easiest. And so I came to Southern California on the 16th of August, 1964, and I was um, actually, what I, my first memory of coming there was, I know it's going to be okay because I'm going to be in charge. And I knew that everybody would have to shape up because I was in charge and they would, I would then feel better. And I was starting off this new whole deal. I was going to be the principal of the school and the mother superior of the nanny bunnies that were all there running around, you know, hundreds of them in those days. 
and um, and what I recall most from the 16th of August 1964 that it was very hot. We were wearing all those nunny clothes for those of you who remember somebody like us, and we were well dressed, you know, very heavily clad, and we had this white stuff all over our faces, and we had this long black serge wool, you know, it was really hot. But I knew that I was going to be okay because I was going to be in charge. In fact, sir, for those of you who have never seen people like me dressed up in those nunny clothes, were on the outside of the bottle of blue nun wine. Uh, <laughs> She's blue and we were black. Uh, but everything was wonderful in Southern California for several days. I think it was four or five days and until I was to meet somebody who was to become my arch enemy for many years afterwards, and he was known as the pastor. Now, he had this problem, and this problem was that he thought that he was in charge, and I knew that I was in charge. And immediately, our horn flopped. You know, we just, uh, and I started slamming his demise. And we started to try to fight nicely. Now, I don't think you've ever tried to do that, where you try to not anyone to know that you're killing, dying, that you're, you're planning murder, you know, in your mind. But uh, we were trying to act like we were very nice uh, in public, but we were really, oh, we were having a lot of problems. And this went on and went on, and I was in a new culture, new system of education, everything was new. And one day, I was in my office after school. And a lady came to my office and she said, Sister, would you like to have all the sisters come over and swim at our swimming pool? And so after school, we piled all the nunny bunnies into the station wagon, because in those days, all the nuns were station wagons. And uh, we got over there to her swimming pool, and we got into our swimsuits, had a wonderful time, and she came out to the side of the pool, and she had a tray, and there was a large pitcher and some glasses. And on the top of the glasses, there was salt. And uh, one or two of you might know what was in the picture. When I, when I talk about this in Australia and in, in England, they, it goes right over their heads. You know, they have no idea what was in the picture. And my personal opinion is that, and that is all it is, my personal opinion, is that if you haven't had a margarita, maybe you don't belong yet. <laughs> my sponsors always tell me not to say that, too. But uh, anyway, um, gosh, this stuff was wonderful. I will never forget this. It, it went right down into my innermost being. It was like a spiritual awakening. And uh, I knew that I need I needed to have more of this to help me because I was too pressured and I was very stressed. And I worked very hard and I was in a strange land away from my family. And it was just really hard. And uh, I just knew that I needed to get more of this stuff. And I asked the lady, would she please give me the recipe? And uh, she gave me the recipe to take home, and I just thought the nicest thing that I could do for these nunny bunnies was to put this up on a regular basis so that they'd all feel better because it worked for me. <laughs> and they worked very hard for me because I was uh, one of these more active alcoholic personalities. There are some people in alcoholic, uh, who, some alcoholic personalities who are a little kind of on the procrastinating side and who sort of are a little bit laid back and all. I wasn't one of those people at all. I'm a very active per, uh, personality, and so I believed in a lot of activity wherever I was. And I would say to them on Fridays often, I would say, let's change all the classrooms. Let's put the second graders into the fourth grade. Let's put the sixth graders into the eighth grade. Let's put the first graders into the seventh grade. And just push chairs and throw books and throw tennis shoes, and we just do general chaos. I know chaos. I, I really do. I think this is very exciting. It's very nice getting. But uh, anyway, these girls work very hard because they work for me. So on a regular basis, I would say to them, are you tired? They were always tired. And they would say, yes, we had report cards last week, or we had parent-teacher conferences. And then I would say, well, let's celebrate this evening. I would never say, girls, let's all get drunk this evening. It never occurred to me to say it like that. I thought that the word celebration had a kind of a liturgical note. You know? <laughs> it sort of sounds like a you know, sort of holy. And uh, but what, what I soon learned was that their idea of celebration and mine were entirely different. Because when they would come to this little celebration we would have, they would say such things as, let's have the little glasses. Now, I need to let you know that I was never interested in little glasses. I was interested in large containers, like maybe a, a flower pot, maybe, if I could get it. I was interested in large drafts, and I just um, 
never could understand why they would sit. They, they sit. I never knew how to sit. And they would sit, and they would let it go down nice and slowly, and then they would never finish their alcohol. I never can understand people who don't finish their alcohol. I notice people on airplanes every weekend because I get to travel most weekends, and I notice that on airplanes the people don't finish their alcohol. I never understand that. It's that I'm a golfer. <laughs> and um, I would take large drafts and we would soon be gone. And so uh, I started into my drinking career in the most, uh, in a wonderful spot called the convent. And uh, I was very smart because I knew that if you drank on the job that I, you, you'd be an alcoholic. And I fought for many years trying not to be. I was trying to do what chapter 3 of the big book says that we can't do. I was trying to uh, control and enjoy my drinking. Some of you might have tried that. And what my experience was that when I controlled my drinking, I could never enjoy it. And when I enjoyed my drinking, I could never control it. This is really strange. And I just thought that there was some little magic trick to this. And I never could get back down to a science. So I was kind of smart, and I knew not to drink on the job, and I knew not to drink in the morning, and I knew not to drink and drive. So I had to pick my spot. So we had this one man who had a, he had a, a place down in Mexico, which was two hours away from where I lived, on the border. And he had a little trailer, and he said to me one day, you know, we hardly ever use this anymore. Why don't you take the keys and go down there and, and relax sometimes? And he handed me the keys. And he, there were three keys on the key chain. And he said, this is the key at the front door, and this is the key of the cabana. And sister, this is the key of the liquor cabinet. Help yourself. And I said, praise God from whom all blessings flow. <laughs> And I, uh, I said to the sisters, you know, pretty soon more than 50% of Southern California would be Hispanic. So what we need to do is to go down to Mexico often so that we can learn Spanish. <laughs> so on a regular basis, we would pile all the money bodies into the station wagon. And we would go down there and we'd try to uh, learn Spanish with all the Americans and the Canadians who are down in the Cedar Beach. And um, that's how my drinking career really started. And uh, I, I joined things, you know, I joined committees. I was in charge of everything. I, I didn't know, I'm sure some of you were in charge of the United States of America too, but I didn't know about them. I wish I had known. But it was really hard work, and I, I joined all sorts of different task forces, and I was doing so much work because I knew that if I, I could overcompensate by working hard, and eventually I could get to reward myself with some drinking. And drinking was like the song Willie Nelson sings, it was always on my mind, always on my mind. And I would wake up at 2.10 in the morning or 2.12 on the digital clock and it would always occur to me, oh, I would like to have a drink. And I knew that if you drank at 2.12 in the morning that you would probably be an alcoholic and you weren't supposed to do that. And also it was very really hard to procure it in the world that I lived in. And I'd have to, you know, just find ways and means of doing this. I can remember just the pain of not knowing what to do. One of the things I used to do at 2.12 in the morning was I used to get up and walk the halls of the convent. And I would go down to our little chapel that we have there. And I would say, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced anger with God. You look like you're really cold here. But I, I you know, I just did. I had a lot of terribly deep, angry feelings at God. In fact, what I did was, I used to go down to the chapel and I used to give God the finger. You probably don't even know what that is, but the Israelites taught me that when I was teaching in uh, school. And um, I used to do that a lot. And uh, I was just really upset with everything. And, and it was just awful. And then I thought, well, you know what I'll do? I think I'll stop drinking. And so I stopped drinking for a while and... Uh, what I started to do then was to shake and sweat and, and get really upset and I went to the doctor and the doctor gave me some stuff called Elevel and Celsine and then uh, he graduated me after a couple of weeks into another thing called Valium and Librium and I had these four prescriptions and uh, he thought I would be good and follow directions but I didn't still have a great trouble following directions and then um, but what I found out about uh, taking prescription drugs for me was that they made me feel like the music on Twilight Zone. They made me feel like, nah, 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 nah. you know, the lights are on, but there's nobody home. And it was just really strange. And so I went back to drinking again because alcohol was the drug of my choice for sure. And uh, then I, I thought, well, I know what I do so that I can get this thing done. I pray more. I do some more praying. 
So I went up to Northern California and I made what was called a 30 day retreat. And um, on day, I, I did a lot of praying every day and a lot of fasting. And on day 15 of those 30 days, we were told that we were going to have what was called a break day, that we didn't have to do any of the retreat exercises. And the other people said to me, what would you like to do today since you come from Southern California? And I said, I would like to go and visit the Napa Valley, please. <laughs> and so we went and we visited all the wineries. And uh, I can remember just uh, feeding no pain at all that evening and waking up the next morning and wanting to drink more than anything else in the entire world. And when I would drink, when we could drink and we had celebrations, the sisters would say, always say to me the next day, my, but you were something last night. Now, I was their boss, and I, I never wanted to ask them exactly what something was. I still have it to this day. I'm not sure exactly what happened. But what I need to let you know is, and I could stand here for many hours to tell you some of the shenanigans that I got involved in with my drinking, but it's interesting for me that when I see a group of you, and many of you in this room this evening, I understand, are in recovery. And if I were to meet you on a one-on-one, -on -one, which I won't have time to do with this short stay I have, but if I were to meet those of you in recovery, and if I were to say to you, as I look right into your eyes, if I were to say to you, how did you die? Do you remember where you were? Do you remember, you know, were you in a hospital or in a jail? Were you highly functioning on a job? Were you at home trying to raise your children? Do you remember where you were? And when I say that, I, I recall the words of Bill Wilson, our founder, our co-founder, when he writes his story on page 8 of the big book, and he says that no words can tell of the loneliness and the bitter morass of self-pity that he found himself in. But he knew that alcohol had uh, overwhelmed him, had overcome him, and he had met his match. He had been able to do many successful things in his life, but alcohol was the one thing that he could not overcome. And that moment, I think, that moment of clarity, where we come to that, is a very sacred moment in, in our lives of those of us who are in recovery. And in my life, I was in a convent when that happened to me. And I was standing there, and I didn't know who to ask or who to talk to or how to tell this to anybody. How can the boss of the world tell the people in the world that she needs help? I mean, how can you do that? How can you move out of being this victim of the delusion that you can rest satisfaction and happiness if only you learn how to manage well? And I had learned how to manage well. How can somebody like me admit and surrender to the whole idea that you need help? It's really, really something. And I was standing in our living room, it's called the community room. And I was looking through this little template. There's a little book that's put out on a monthly basis for nuns. And it's called Sisters Today. And on the very back page, there's, there was an ad. And the ad said, Sister, are you concerned about your drinking? If so, please call the following number collect. Well, as far as I'm concerned, that was a miracle because out of the thousands of sisters in the United States being as unique as I am, I thought I was the only alcoholic nun in the United States. Or the only... A nun who had a problem with drinking. And so I made this telephone call from Massachusetts, as it turned out to be. And um, I told this lady, I wasn't able to tell her the truth because I was incapable of doing that. I told her, first of all, I told her I was changing jobs. Now that part was true. I was moving from being a school principal into working in the diocese where I worked for many years afterwards. But then I told her that I was going to be working with a lot of priests who were drinkers and a lot of nuns who were drinkers. And I didn't know how to deal with them, and I didn't know how to counsel them, and could she please help me? And she told me she would help me. She would send me some literature. She told me about recovery centers all over the United States, and she told me about Alcohol Anonymous and various other programs that I could get help for all of these people about whom I was very concerned. <laughs> and she promised to send me some literature, and I was just about to hang up the phone and bid her good evening, and she said to me a most extraordinary thing. She said, Sister, would you like to tell me a little bit about your own drinking? Because I can hear pain in your voice. I'm always amazed at the people in Massachusetts. They must be awfully smart. But um, she could hear this pain in my voice. And I think that that's one of the miracles of the program. I think that uh, 
we get to hear the pen in one another's voices, and we get to see the pen in one another's eyes, and because we get to know that because of our own experience and our own pain, we then get up to reach out and help in the healing process of one another. And she was able to say that to me, and for some reason, and I believe it was a moment of God, it was a moment of grace for me, uh, I was able to break down into the telephone and cry. And I told her I did not know where to turn, and who to ask, and where to get help, and I knew I could never go to a recovery hospital, and what could I do, and I was dying, and what was going to become of me at all. And she said, well, you might want to try to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, the following day I called Alcoholics Anonymous in a town which was quite a distance from where I lived because in those days I used to be very important. And um, she, uh, I, I called this phone number in a place called Whittier and I went to Alcoholics Anonymous my first meeting. And in those days we were wearing kind of a, a modified nanny habit and um, I can recall exactly what I did. I told everybody in the school that I was going to a meeting, which was true because I was going to all sorts of meetings. I was in charge of everything. And um, so I was going to this meeting, so I changed into regular clothes, and I remember exactly what I did. I put on a whole bunch of eye makeup, and I went to a, an AA meeting in a place called Serenity Hall in Whittier, California. And it was, um, it was like one of these little tiny clubs. I don't know if you have them here. You probably do. It was like an Alano club. It was very small and very smoky. And I went in there, and there were a lot of little old men, and it seemed like they were all shuffling all around Serenity Hall here. And there were two women. One left, and the other stayed. And the one who stayed was, as we say in Ireland, she was not the full shilling. <laughs> She was laughing at the wrong times, and she was clapping at the wrong times, and she was absolutely crazy. And I can remember sitting huddled up in the corner just petrified. And then there was a man got up to the podium to share his experience, strength, and hope with us. And um, he was interesting because uh, he had been to jail, and now he'd gotten his family back, and he was sober and all. But he was fascinating to me because he was using words that I used to punish the eighth graders for writing on the bathroom wall. You probably don't know what they are here, but uh, one of them begins with sh, and then he graduated into another one that starts with sh. Now, what was very interesting to me was he was using the sh word in sentences. In fact. He was using the third word in various parts of speech, like a noun and adverb of preposition. And, <laughs> and uh, he was using the third word with ing on the end and ed at the end. And on one occasion, he used the third word with the word mother before. <laughs> and I remember saying to myself, and this is going to be my spiritual leader for the rest of the <laughs> And then, when he was all finished, he said, keep coming back. It worked. <laughs> oh, I was very upset. What I recall about that, though, was that I got into my car, and I was very upset, and I was crying. Oh, I didn't want to be there at all. And uh, this eye makeup that I put in my eyes was running down my face, and I looked at myself in the mirror, as they sometimes do at the stop signs, and um, I remember I said the shirt word and the front word all the way up. Lord, we need it. There was something in the meeting that drew me back, and I found other meetings, and I kept going to meetings. Now, I know, just looking at some of your faces, I know by looking at you that the minute that you came into a program of recovery, whatever you came into, that you just fit it in immediately. You look like you all fit it into everything. Well, I need to let you know that I was not one of you like that. I, I just couldn't do that easily. I was a fighter. You see, I come from Ireland, and uh, I come from the northern part of Ireland, and the graffiti that we put in our walls, there is no surrender. And you come into a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, and they tell you that you have to let go, <laughs> and you have to surrender, or else you won't win. You know, that doesn't make any sense to somebody like me. It's, it's way down deep in my bones and in my blood and in my culture and my heritage that I'm, I'm supposed to fight to the death, you know. 
And I come to this program and they said, you have to let go be, you have to stop fighting. I couldn't get this thing at all. They were saying really strange things to me. They were saying, don't drink. <laughs> that was very strange. And then they said, go to meetings. Now, I just took all of these pieces of paper in my bottom drawer that tell you, would tell you that I know some things. And I didn't think there was anything at meetings that would enhance me at all. I thought that I knew all the things that were supposed to be known and I could read about and I would find out enough. Then it was a book. Now, I took this book and I read it. And what I discovered when I read it was that the, the syntax of the grammar offended my sensibilities as an English major coming from the University of London. And I told them this, Mr. Randy Hall, and they said, uh, he's coming back, please. <laughs> really kind. And then they told me that I had to get this thing called a sponsor. I would love to know how people just say that. You know, it's just like it's an easy thing to do. A sponsor when you don't trust to anybody, you know. So what I did was I interviewed people. And uh, I hired them on temporarily, and when I didn't care for what they were telling me, I would get rid of them. And I didn't do any of this stuff. And then they said I was supposed to work the steps. And I was in AA for quite some months. In fact, I think I was just a year or so. And I was very uncomfortable in the program. But the only thing I didn't do was I didn't drink. And the reason I didn't drink was because I knew that the people in Alcoholics Anonymous there would know, because we're very nosy people, very curious. They'd look into your face and they'd know. And these women would say such things. She didn't know if you had cereal, didn't know what brand it was, like four years ago, you know, they just were so strange. And um, they were always trying to find things out about me, and they were always uh, wanting to touch me and hug me and stuff. And I, I was very private and weird, and I didn't want to do any of that stuff. And I just didn't know how it was going to stand out how it's anonymous. So one day I went back, kept going back to these meetings, thinking one day something's going to happen and going to be different. And I was in Serenity Hall this one day. I, I, I like to share this because uh, sometimes I find as I go around the country that uh, there is a chance of what happens to us as we are in recovery for a while. I think sometimes we can get stuck. We can get stuck in our recovery. And that means that we, we get to a sort of a plateau where we don't know how to move on to the next point. And this is a recipe that this little old man told me has always worked for me. So I want to share with you. He said to me, uh, uh, B, you know, you're always miserable in, in the program. And I said, yes, I, I am. I don't care for this. And I told him all the things I didn't like. And he said, you know, that this program is supposed to help you to be happy, joyous, and free. Well, I hadn't caught on to that part at all yet. And he said, you know, I'm going to tell you something that might work for you. Why don't you go home to your convent and um, kneel on your knees and uh, pray? and ask God to give you the willingness to change your attitude. Now, with all of the information that I've been given, and I've been given lots of opportunities uh, for enlarging my growth and so on, and I never heard anybody saying that to me before in those words. And I was in such emotional pain that when I got home, I knelt down and I, um, I prayed and I asked God to please give me some willingness to change my attitude. Now, what I'd like to tell you is that uh, God appeared to me and that there was a burning bush and there were angels and there was a rainbow and all, and none of that happened to me at all. But what I do need to share with you is that um, God only does uh, Saturday. You know, God just gives me enough willingness to do today. He doesn't do March 1st before March 1st. And uh, what I discovered also was that any time I get stuck, when I have to move from one surrender to the next, which, uh, as uh, somebody mentioned here earlier, if, if I had known that it was one surrender to the next, I don't think I would have stayed. Uh, but, but I discovered that when I pray for this willingness to become unstuck, it always happens for me. And that's a magnificent thing. What I began to understand, though, was that... Um, Little by little by little, the craving, or as the book tells us, the phenomenon of craving has been removed from me and has been for many years now. And uh, I got to understand something about the joy of the program. And typically what would be happening for me would be I would go to most of the meetings, or in my early meetings, and I would be crying. I'd be crying from fear and anger and frustration and just not knowing what to do next. Just complete frustration. In fact, in Serenity Hall in Whittier, they used to call me the crying nun. I didn't know that, but they told me that afterwards. I probably never would have come back if they had. 
But anyway, um, what I discovered was that this is a, is a very magnificent program. And when Doug was talking earlier, he commented on the magic of the program. And I think the magic of the program comes for us when we can discover what this big secret is. And there is a big secret for us. And the big secret is that we discover that this thing, you know, uh, we have, this disease that we're totally powerless over that, and we get to understand that we're powerless over that and everything else. And that we get to latch on or draw on to this being in a new and different, most wonderful way called a higher power. And then we, we let go, finally, and we, we let go little by little, and sometimes we take back, and sometimes we let go, and sometimes we take back, and sometimes we let go. But what the book talks about in page 62, it says that the selfishness and self-centeredness and wanting to be in charge and do all this stuff is our problem. That's really what our problem is. And it's interesting to me how it mentions the word self and selfishness and self-centered 13 times in page 62, as I'm sure many of you know. But this is what it says to me. It says to me, it says to me at the bottom of that page, it says, D, this is the how and the why of it. You have to quit playing God because it doesn't work. And hereafter, in this drama of life, God is going to be your director. He's the principal, and you're his agent, and he's the father, and you're his child. And you know what, D, most good ideas are simple. In fact, they're so simple, be that you might not get it. You know, you just might be too complicated to get this. But this uh, this concept that God's in charge is the keystone of the new and triumphant art through which you will pass through freedom. Now, ladies and gentlemen, all I've ever wanted in my whole life was this inner freedom, this wonderful inner freedom that I feel tonight as I stand before you without a nerve in my body, this inner freedom that I've been feeling for a long, long time now where I can look the word in the eye. And what this, the discovery that I have made is through the working of the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous that there are all these other promises that are caught in there in the steps that I'm sure you are very well aware of, those of you who are working the program, and you will know that as well as the promises that we usually allude to on pages 83 and 84, that there are promises caught into most of the steps. And you probably know that in step three, where we turn, uh, completely turn our will and our life over to the care of God, that there are 13 promises all caught in there at the top of page 63. And the first one is, B, you know what? When you sincerely take this position that God's in charge, all sorts of remarkable things will follow. All sorts of remarkable things will follow. You're going to have a new employer from now on, B, and this new employer that you have is all powerful and will provide everything you need as long as you stay close and do this work well. And the miracle for you, B, is that you are going to become less and less interested in yourself and your own little plans and designs, and you're going to get more and more interested in what you can contribute to life. And as a result of that, you're going to see new power flow into your life. You're going to see God's presence. You are going to discover that you can face life successfully, and above all things, D, you are going to lose your fear of today and tomorrow and the hereafter. In fact, D, what's going to happen for you is that you are going to be reborn. You're totally going to get started all over again. Well, this has become a fascinating study for me, these promises that are causing the success. In fact, as I was sharing with Ron, and Donna and Diana earlier was that one of the things that I do when I don't do this, I give retreats on the promises and other topics from the big book. But what I discovered was that there are 84 promises all caught in there in the steps. And uh, I love when I when I uh, give I do retreats with men and women and uh, some mix and sometimes I do with all men and all women. And I say to the men when I get them uh, involved, I say to them, you know, I bet you didn't know that there were six promises for step four, and they look at me like, no, they didn't, and I say to them, there are two for intentment, and two for fear, and two for sex. So please come back after the break. They all do. They all come back after the break and see what I have to say. And what I, what I discovered is that there are six promises in step four, and there are ten in step five, on page 75 of the big book, and then there are the promises that we talk about in, in steps eight and nine. 
And then the promises of step 10, where we keep fighting everything and everybody, even alcohol. Imagine a woman from the north of Ireland stopping fighting. Isn't that miraculous? You know, just get to stop fighting. I don't have to go to war anymore with anybody or anything. And uh, it's marvelous. I'm uh, embarrassed to tell you that I used to uh, teach prayer and meditation. I still do. But I used to think I used to think that I knew how to do that until I found you, people like you, who taught me uh, how to do this well by referring me to page 86 and page 87 of the big book. And what it tells me there is that the minute I wake up in the morning, I have to, um, you know, ask God to direct my thinking and consider my plans for the day. I have a friend who says, my head would destroy me if it didn't need me for transportation. My head would destroy me if it didn't need me for transportation because I wake up sometimes and I'm not really nice. Uh, I can be waking up and resentment is waiting for me at the bottom of the bed and saying, Dee, I've been waiting here since 3 o'clock. Please wake up because we have to do somebody now. And, uh, you know, it's easy to get into that. And so what page 86 and page 87 tells me exactly what I'm supposed to do. It tells me what I'm supposed to do when I'm agitated, when I'm indecisive. It's easy to become agitated in the kind of life I live. You know, they cancel airplanes on me lots. They, uh, they keep me waiting in line. They delay me. Uh, last week, I almost missed my thing getting from Minneapolis to Duluth. And they didn't consult me about the snow on Duluth either. Thank you, by the way, for the wonderful weather you provided here. Such <laughs> a great surprise. But, you know, things in life are, are agitating. And what I didn't know was that... Uh, Basically, my problem is that I'm generally a restless person, and I'm just irritable, and, and I do that just uh, very naturally. And what the steps do is they have to even me out. They have to keep me uh, sort of evened out so that uh, I can always be in touch with the causes and conditions of my alcoholism today. I get to move around the country a great deal, and what I find out for me is that the more I get to do this, the closer I have to be to my own program of recovery. I uh, average at least four to five meetings for myself each uh, week. I, um, in fact, I go to an early morning meeting. My, my morning meeting is at six o'clock, so if any of you ever come to California, please come to the attitude modification meeting we have, and Adam and I is the best meeting in the world, I think. I'm sure you think your meetings are the best meetings in the world, too. But um, I go to lots of meetings, and I have two wonderful sponsors, and I sponsor other people. And I find that as I work in this aspect uh, of the field, the spirituality of the program, I find that I have to, to work harder on my own program than I've ever had to work before. I'm not sure exactly how this thing works. The, the mystery uh, has eluded me all these years. I, I just don't get it. I don't know where the magic comes from exactly. But I do know it's here. Um, I know that uh, when I least expect it, I will be helping somebody. And when I, when I think mostly that I'm helping somebody, somebody else is. I don't know if you ever go to meetings sometimes and you hear some fools ranting and raving and saying the same thing over and over and over again. And uh, as the book says, we never criticize. One of our speakers says that he doesn't know which part of never we don't get, whether it's no or good. You know, that's just... You know, that God somehow is rippling through these programs all the time doing his thing. And uh, I discovered that. I discovered that when I used to expect that God's working, I was working with somebody some years back, and uh, she was very in earnest about the program, except that she wouldn't stop drinking. She would go to meetings, and she would write stuff, and she would go to, go to step studies and all, and she kept telling me she was still going to drink. And one day this foolish man stood up at a meeting and he said the same thing again, like he always did. And at the very end he said, and this program works best if you don't drink or use any mind-altering drugs between meetings. And when we got in the car to go home, she held me by the hand and she said, Dee, we're not supposed to drink between meetings. It gave me to understand that, you know, God works in the most extraordinary places. Uh, and I, I just will never know how that works. In fact, when I talk about the mystery, it keeps me it keeps me doing this thing that you have here, you know, recovering, living it and loving it. And, and I am a firm believer of loving it, because if I weren't loving it, I don't think I would still be around. And as I go around the country, I do what we're not supposed to do. I take lots of inventory. And what I notice is that there are three classes, there are three types of recovery. 
the first bit type is when people first bit get into recovery, they switch maybe from drugs and alcohol into what we call in California, I know you don't do this here, but we call in California, they switch to relationships. You've probably never heard of that here. And uh, what they do is if they get involved in relationships in a big way, and I call that no light day. Uh, then we get into the, uh, the second phase, or the second brand, it's called like for people get sober or whatever it is, and they, they are in a program for four or five years, and it starts shaping up, and it looks better, and they get their kids back, and their jobs back, and things are looking good, and then it gets boring, and people get stuck, and, uh, and, and I see, I do, I see a lot of unhappy people in recovery too sometimes, and, and believe me, that's something I don't want to be, I don't want to be an old member of Alcoholics Anonymous and be unhappy because I was too unhappy before I got here, and I never want to be unhappy again. And so what I'm after is the, the kind of happy stuff that you seem to have here, the, the stuff that uh, it gives us the joy of the program, that you live it and you love it. And if you're always trying to find out what is it that makes things, this thing work, this, uh, the way that this joy and this energy generates all over this land and all over this world, it's amazing. It reminds me of the words of uh, Shakespeare, in the, in the play King Lear where he talks to his daughter and he says uh, something like this that we should live and pray and sing and tell old tales who's in and who's out and take upon us the mystery of things as though we were God's spies. Those of us who have been in recovery get to take upon ourselves the mystery of things as though we were God's spies. And we get to see how God works in the most extraordinary cases when we least expect it, and people get into recovery. What a miracle. What a miracle world we get to live in. What a great generation this is, where we're able to break the pattern of the cycle that you're doing so well through this hospital program you have here. The cycle of addiction that's been handed on from generation to generation. And for that reason, then, we get the chance to break that cycle and to do it differently in these years of our lives. What a miracle we have with the consciousness that we've been given, with the awakenings that are happening all over this land. And we're able then to put our hands out to other people and generate this mystery and this love and this inner freedom to the world. My personal belief and the belief of many here, I'm sure, is that the first steps of Alcoholics Anonymous can and will change the face of the earth. May God bless you. I love you and thank you for having me here.